Welcome to Crypto Law. I'm your host, Anne Sophie Glutz. So, thank you so much, Sheila, for making time to talk to us today about DeFi and regulation and everything else that's been going on. It's been busy weeks. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, so, just a very brief introduction, and below in the in the chat, you'll see a, a larger bio of Sheila. But just a short, very brief introduction is Sheila is working. Um, with the World Economic Forum, where she's part of the executive committee and um, is also head of data, blockchain, digital assets. And there's so many other things that make Sheila the perfect person to talk to today. So thank you so much for making time to us, uh, time to talk to us about um, everything that's been going on, which is quite a lot. So thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me on, Sophie. It's great to be here. And I, I love talking about this topic. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed I noticed also from the Money Reimagined podcast that you hosted uh, a few episodes on DeFi, DAOs, decentralized networks. So all of these great themes that we can talk about today, hopefully. So perhaps yeah, as a first, <laughs> great. As a first introductory question, perhaps, what do you see in decentralized finance and DeFi as some of the key opportunities or key risks that people should be aware of? Well, I think there's both. Uh, I think that we kind of have to start with the predicate that our existing financial system has gaps in service. It does not serve uh, every citizen in the entire world uh, equally. It is not necessarily a democratically built system, let's put it that way. And that historical exclusion has led to profound differences in the financial welfare and well-being of citizens around the world. And so I think if you take that as an assumption base, as a starting point, you can imagine how a reconstruction or reimagining of financial services that's based on a foundation of a distributed ledger or blockchain uh, with smart contracts coded in can actually be quite significant and noteworthy. Um, I think there's questions at this point in time of the evolution. This is a this is a relatively nascent space, but it is a very rapidly evolving space. Uh, and so, to some extent, to answer your question, Enzo, the full scope of risks and potential are are still being determined, kind of in real time. Um, I also think that there are really interesting challenges in regulating a space like this that that's moving so quickly and so fast. So, um, as a general matter, when I think about opportunities and I think about uh, challenges, I think the challenges are just simply that the space is moving so very, very, very quickly. And it's hard to almost keep pace with what is what is happening, let alone to understand what are the services or products that are actually providing value and what are kind of you know, novelty items that maybe are not necessarily uh, providing the same value, or maybe you're only providing value to a very small segment of the population versus a much more open, I would say, um, opportunity space You know, for, for a broader set of citizens. Um, in terms of opportunities, however, I think that this is a chance to actually work and recognize the things that have not necessarily been productive or um, uh, uh, equal access, right, in the existing systems. And so the idea that you'd have a system based on decentralized governance that would provide more access that wouldn't necessarily be limited to decisions a centralized authority can make about who has that kind of access is very powerful. And I think you touched on some important topics, like what you said, financial inclusion, and there's some regulatory risks and perhaps concerns. Do you think that many regulators or lawmakers or policymakers in general understand both sides of the equation? Do you think that there is perhaps like, the concern I often hear is that DeFi is only about speculation and that there's nothing about financial inclusion yet? Do you think that, well, from what you tell me, I think you see both, you see two different sides. And do you think um, we should give DeFi the chance to evolve and see if it can um, perhaps move beyond some of the speculative cases that con regulators are currently concerned about? What What is your opinion about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to be, as a general matter, pro-experimentation innovation as just a general stance, you know, and I tend to think that we we should perhaps let things uh, settle a bit and kind of see what is actually happening in a space before we make a decision that's strong one way or the other, either to condemn or to, uh, you know, go big on that space, right? Like to be wedded to it or to kind of detract it from it specifically. And I just think in DeFi, it's a bit too early to kind of say whether it's going to be a value, like I said, in an inclusion model or just more generally. But I want to touch on one thing, which is even if it is about opening up the opportunity to speculate, you know, that has also been a closed system, right? And so you could argue that uh, people's access into speculative assets has really been quite limited and that that may be positive on the one hand, it, it's protective of, of people, you know, so you can't accidentally give away your house and your shirt and, you know, your, your family's livelihood and all of that. Um, at the same time, it, there are significant barriers to entry that I, I would argue aren't necessarily fair. 
And I think you saw kind of this summer of of DeFi in a way around things like GameStop or others where you kind of saw this recognition that, hey, you know, why is it that trading desks can do things that I, with a group of us on Reddit or whatever, can't do? Like, is that fair? Is that reasonable? Should there be maybe less of a kind of... um, paternalistic approach, which again, has its pros to it, that there's some benefit to that. Uh, But should it be maybe less about that and more about our ability to self-determine what we speculate into? And I think there's actually an argument to be made there that's quite important, even if you only look at the speculative use case. Now, I would argue that there's a lot more that DeFi can do beyond just that use case. And that that is a very narrow view of the potential and opportunity here. But even if you took that as gospel, I still think that there's an opportunity there to think about broadening access. And I think broadening access is very important. So financial inclusion and broadening access may be wider than what we typically think we're going to bank the unbanked. So you say there may be many opportunities, even if we're not thinking about giving a bank account to the unbanked, but there's still opportunities for them broader access for other people who are being shut off from certain traditional financial services, even though perhaps not to the extreme of being unbanked. I think that's right. And I think when you look at the sheer inequity in our in our wealth in, in society, right? If you look at that globally, country to country, and you look at it within a country, social class, social class, it's shocking. I mean, it truly is shocking what's happened over the last decade. And just that divide has grown and grown and grown and grown. So even if we are able to basically um, provide more access to some of those top levels. I actually think that's something that we should, as a society, be insisting upon, first of all. But this could be a kind of a way of starting there and then saying, what have we learned in an environment that, you know, we're not as concerned about the average person losing their life savings. It really is people that do have some, you know, some ability to engage in a bit of a speculative um, play. So we're less concerned about the consumer protection kind of part of it, let's say. But how do we democratize access and say, you don't have to be part of these elite and institutions or whatever it might be in order to gain that kind of opportunity, you actually have a chance to do this in a more uh, democratized fashion. I think that is it. That is not what I would have chosen as a starting place. But if that's where we are, that isn't necessarily a bad thing is what I'm trying to say. I see. That's an interesting point. I think it touches on it. It, it, it gives a new perspective on this claim of oh, financial inclusion is not really what DeFi is all about. It just shows that we may have to think more broadly about pain points in the current system that DeFi may address. And as you said before, it, the space moves so quickly. It's so difficult to <laughs> catch up, even if you're in it, let alone when you're a regulator policymaker with so many other things on your mind. Do you think there are enough data for people to assess DeFi, like when it comes to empirical data? Or are there, are there any specific knowledge gaps that you think academics or the industry could um, could address to help explain what it is and what, what it could and could not do? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, I ought to point to our DeFi Policymakers Toolkit as kind of a, a good example. We just issued something called a DeFi Policymaker Toolkit uh, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, that really is kind of our pulling together of what is really out there, what we've seen, what uh, currently ha- is sticky, what seems to be sticky, what uh, kind of has weight behind it or gravity behind it, and what might be a little bit more speculative or novelty in terms of where the, the direction of travel for the space. Um, I, I worry a lot about what I call premature regulation, and that's true not just in D5, but kind of across the crypto ecosystem. I think in some cases, you know, we've things have been around for a little while and we kind of understand what they are and what they aren't to some extent. Um, but in any by any calculation, we're just we're extraordinarily early. And so my concern is that any regulation that would be extremely well-intentioned uh, would have the result of cutting off innovation that could actually be very, very powerful. And, you know, I'm not a person that thinks that the entire system needs to fundamentally crumble for us to achieve success. I think that opening up the system, even if, you know, it's only used by, you um, a, a broader segment than it than currently has access today. I think we have to claim that for what it is and hope that we can build on that to create an even more powerful and empowered system of financial actors. Uh, I, my personal, you know, is, is probably anyone who kind of knows me, my personal uh, concerns are far more about, as you noted, the unbanked, the underbanked, uh, people who have no access to credit lines, no insurance. And I actually think DeFi could be a very powerful opportunity to think about credit and to think about new forms of credit that aren't determined simply by a centralized uh, body that is applying you know, their own bias towards this, the decision around who is credit worthy and who is not credit worthy, which is just an inherently biased calculation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, these protocols don't do that. There isn't that bias built into them. So the opportunity for non-traditional actors to gain credit that could be extremely powerful and life-changing and community life-changing, I think is extraordinarily exciting to me. And insurance, the idea that a lot of times in our systems, all the reward goes to one class of persons and all the risk is borne by another class of persons. And you can think about that 
that both in the stakeholders of an, of an institution, the employees versus the shareholders, right? But you can also think about it more broadly in capital market creation. So I think the other um, opportunity here that's really powerful is insurance. And I would hate to see regulation that's aimed at speculative use cases that cuts off the ability to grow the credit and insurance spaces specifically, because those are uh, what I find most powerful potentially, um, because it wasn't necessarily being considered in the regulations. That's why I kind of use the term premature regulation. And I think that in DeFi, my I think our default assumption should be that regulation would likely be premature regulation just because we are so very early. Yes. And I think well, some of the comments that um, I've heard in the DeFi community saying we should never forget what regulation is for, what the broad aims are of regulation, and start from that rather than thinking, okay, there's something new we don't understand. There may be risks like with everything else. And therefore, we should intervene now that we think about what are the, the, the broader principles and can we apply them in perhaps different ways on DeFi. And one of the... yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, I just think that there's there's a fear pro, a fear based approach to regulation and an opportunity based approach to regulation. And so where I'm seeing opportunity based approach, things that are saying, hey, we should make sure this opportunity remains available to a broad, the broadest class of people possible, which I would argue should be like everybody. But, you know, it depends on who you are. Right. Uh, and maybe your, your jurisdiction or your what your domain is that you're regulating um, versus, oh, gosh, because there's some potential risk here, we we must over, you know, perhaps index on that perceived or actual, or in some cases, actual to be fair risk, and therefore cut everything off, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's which way are you approaching it? And a lot of that is political, it's politically driven, it's personality driven, it's jurisdiction driven, it's a sense of like, what's the opportunity cost or what's at stake, you know, if this goes badly. So I understand how different perspectives emerge. But I think there's a reason that we've seen a lot of uptake in kind of smaller economies that already have maybe less stable financial systems, because the risk there is not perceived to be to the global economy, right, as opposed to very stable economies that are like, ah, what's our risk reward ratio here, right? Like this is, if there's any risk, maybe that's worse than what the potential speculative reward could actually be. So we have to kind of shut it down or be very cautious about how we engage because we don't want to disrupt what is, you know, to be fair, working for maybe a broader swath of people than in maybe some other jurisdictions. Mm-hmm. And perhaps going back to one of the, the, the principles that we could be thinking about is I, I noticed some people in DeFi mentioned, well, actually DeFi could improve regulation or comp- could improve, make it easier for regulators to do their job or for supervisors in the sense that we have so much transparency from this on-chain data and that therefore there is not as much information asymmetry as we have traditionally. There's not the same insider-outsider gap and therefore we may not need the same kind of reporting requirements or other requirements that we see in traditional well, in financial markets. So what do you think of that argument? What do you think about the transparency that DeFi can bring? How do we read those data? How do, in- do we interpret those data on-chain? Yeah, well, I think that is kind of the irony, right? Is that you know, it, it, I'll, I'll kind of use an example that makes it more familiar to maybe some of the the listeners, which is uh, ransomware and Bitcoin. Where there's just like, oh my God, Bitcoin's being used in ransomware attacks, and that's so terrible. But when you look at what actually happens, well, actually, those people are caught pretty quickly, right? So, so it's kind of this. The irony is that all of the concerns around Bitcoin and criminal activity, well, if anything, that's actually not really a tool criminals should be using because it's not that hard to track them down. Uh, And Bitcoin actually creates a ledger and a record of kind of when things happen that makes the at least gives you context clues to figure out who was where and who did what and, you know, whatnot. Right. So. But DeFi is not like Bitcoin. It's it's different, but it, but it's similar from the standpoint of a lot of the things that are touted as being these horrible risks are actually things that, with the right policies in place, you could actually leverage attributes of DeFi to create uh, a system that could create more accountability. And I think that that could be very powerful. Now, to be fair, it's important to note, you know, that just because something is transparent does not mean there's accountability, right? Like. Mm-hmm everything can be transparent, but if I don't know how to make sense of that information or I haven't educated myself as a regulator or a watchdog or whatever and what I'm seeing and what it means and what it doesn't mean, you could actually lead to the wrong accountability or misplaced assumptions or whatever it might be. So I do think there's a need to make sure that we're educating and not to assume that transparency is the end game. Like that's It's transparent, now we're done. We can walk away and it'll just kind of put itself out. That's not how any of this works. There needs to be a structure in place that says, what are we looking for? What does it mean? What are the assumptions that we can and cannot make? What do we, what else do we have to know in order to validate those assumptions, right? All those kinds of things are really important. Uh, And I worry that um, in the community, we kind of tend to wave transparency around as like this, you know, this is it, like, because we're transparent, therefore everything is okay. And that's just really not, that's also not true. So, um, uh, you know, you can, you can overhype transparency as well, (laughs) I suppose is what I'm saying. There are a lot of hypes everywhere, but it's important, therefore, (laughs) to thank you for for bringing you into the discussion. It's very important. 
perhaps a, a very basic question, but what do you think is decentralization? What is true decentralization? And where can this decentralization lead us to? Now we see the D in DeFi in financial services, then we can see decentralization more broadly in governance networks and DAOs. How do you, what is decentralization? How do you think it will evolve? Well, this is, I think, the, you know, the billion dollar, probably trillion dollar question, right? It's like, what what degree of decentralization? Is there a threshold at which you can no longer say something's decentralized because it actually, it does have sort of control that is isolated in certain actors? Um, and I think that, you know, this is, a, this is the hottest topic probably of the day is like, what is, what is the DAO if it's not actually decentralized? Is it simply just providing a cover, you know, for a cabal of actors to actually engage in illicit or, or illicit behavior, or not even illicit behavior, just behavior that doesn't necessarily benefit the entire community, right? And to guise that in the stand, from the standpoint of, oh, we're decentralized, therefore everything's fine. And I think this is an ongoing debate and it's a very healthy debate to be had. Um, I am obsessed with DAOs, uh, as I as I like to say. I just think that things are uh, super, super, uh, these governance models are really powerful. Um, I actually think that when you think about, I'm an I'm a ex-corporate lawyer, so thinking about legal structures, you know, what is a DAO as a legal entity who is accountable? Uh, what does it mean if you have a purely democratic DAO? Let's just say you didn't have any kind of centralization of power of any kind within a DAO. Who is then accountable for anything mm-hmm. Uh, how do you identify them? How do you get anything through? How do you get anything done? You know, we've been experimenting with democracy for you know a very long time in, in human society, and there's a reason that many uh, systems, political systems, have evolved towards more of a republic format, right? Because not everybody wants to be educated about every single thing that happens, um, and a lot of times people there's there's a reason that the thing called the proxy vote exists, right? Because people are pretty comfortable in many cases saying, "Hey, I'm going to delegate to so and so." Well, if you delegate to so and so, and enough of us do that, then suddenly that person is extremely powerful in a way that maybe we didn't intend. Then we've given them rights that we didn't actually think we were going to be giving, right? Or if you have somebody who wound up de facto with just a lot of tokens, a lot of power, right, is represented by tokens, then they're like, oh, I don't want all these tokens. I'm going to give them out to all these different people. Okay, they don't control those people do, but the reality is that they decided who got those tokens, right? And there's an element where you can kind of say, oh, does that accountability still still remain and exist, even though the voting could happen in different ways? So all these questions are really honestly philosophical questions, I would say, but they have very legal, they're going to eventually have legal consequences. And right now they have very practical consequences because if you're putting your faith in something, believing that no one set of actors has undue influence over that thing, and then it turns out that that actually isn't the case, does that undermine the entire proposition? Or do you say that anybody who got involved in it in the first place uh, has community interest at heart and the transparency element that we talked about can actually control that so it can be spotted and redressed? And so these are things I think are really are really complicated questions on Sophie. And I, I don't know that we have answers to them yet, but I think what's important is that there's just this thriving, flourishing DAO ecosystem and we're seeing different approaches to this and some are gonna prove to be better than others. And I think we have to let the experiments continue and kind of see What makes sense? What doesn't work? But I also think we have to be very careful not to rely on feelings alone, not to be emotional about this, but to really examine the evidence and kind of say what proved to be the case. Do we believe that everybody involved in the DAO has the same information about what's happening with the protocol or what's happening with the system? Do we believe that some are more educated than others, maybe because they're spending more time on it, whatever it might be? How do we want to privilege potentially those who maybe have a little bit more knowledge, insider, let's say knowledge about what's actually needed or what's happening uh, in ways that are going to benefit the entire community ultimately and where do you have to kind of have to put a little bit of trust with account trust but verify and put accountability mechanisms into place versus stall every action because you're concerned um, about you know not having enough information or about things going awry yeah I mean, you, you raise so many interesting questions about the liability and things that are evolving and giving the time to 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 well, develop and see if the market can come up at least in some in some instances we see the market is obviously not static. It moves so quickly. It adapts to certain scandals or certain hacks or whatever happens, or just to demands for for more um, for more for different types of governance, whatever it is. So the market as well obviously is moving along. Um, and I'm not sure what you think about where we are in terms of regulation uh, and market where the balance is. But from what you're telling me, it's just what well, we 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 give time to develop because it's such it's so early days. And then we see later on, perhaps if if there's reason and that we perhaps now are tending towards, it must be bad. We don't really know it must be bad. It cannot be, it's not, it's not a traditional structure. And then 
of course, as a, as a corollary, it means that they're very the legal uncertainty facing the sector is high. I'm not sure it actually stopped because DeFi obviously has been booming regardless, but it must be a hamper in some way, like what you're mentioning about DAOs and liability. It must at some point impact um, actors involved, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think as general as a society, because of COVID, we are in a little bit of a, a fear model, right? I just think that is kind of where we are. And that has nothing to do with financial systems. I mean, just think as in general, as a society, we dealt with this, we're dealing with, I should argue, I mean, it's definitely ongoing, Delta variant, right? Lambda, et cetera. Uh, this, this gigantic shock to all of our systems and to every, the life of every single person. No one was not affected by this, you know, this very, very dramatic uh, shock. And so I do think that there's a sense of wanting to proceed more conservatively than we might otherwise want to on the part of, you know, politicians and others, I think, who very rightly want to create a very stable feeling as we slowly and, and with varying degrees in different parts of the world start to reemerge, you know, um, during this pandemic, um, although we'll see what happens. Uh, so I, I certainly can't fault anyone for that. I mean, I think there's there is a there's something to be said about trying to kind of keep things a little, you know, normal, if you will, right, and kind of keep things a little bit, um, a little bit very familiar. Um, that being said, you know, I think that what the pandemic has exposed, and I think this is the more important point, I would argue, is the inequity. There's just the tremendous inequity in our society. And I, again, I say that globally, some countries versus other countries, and just kind of what legacy debt, like all all these kinds of things have been surfaced. What that's meant for healthcare systems. What it's meant for people's livelihoods, for the economy, you know, uh, and then simultaneously uh, with those inequities, we've had an opportunity for people to really just sit down and, and innovate. I mean, people have been, you know, a lot of people who've been privileged enough to not be essential frontline workers have been sitting at home doing their work, you know, and really focusing very, very deeply on, on innovation. And so uh, you have had this tremendous growth uh, across different, you know, not just again, not just in DeFi, across a variety of different um, uh, innovative spaces. And so you're getting kind of this clash where where I think that a lot of uh, the political world and sort of like uh, government leaders and whatnot, regulators and others, you know, are kind of like, well, how are we, our, our first priority is kind of getting things back to feeling okay, again, opening up again and getting the economy stimulated and all these kinds of things, which is a very responsible, you know, approach. However, that in some places is in conflict with kind of the innovations that many people have become used to you know, and kind of the access and the kinds of speed of things people have become used to and the ways people have been reimagining what the world might look like and, and the, the credibility, I think, that we've been able to, to garner during this time. So there's this, you know, kind of conflict. And so that's why I, again, talk about premature regulation. I am not an anti-regulation person. I think that uh, when you work with regulators and, and you kind of think about, right, I, I have this image I use of like a big gorilla that can kind of cradle a little kitten, right? That's like the gorilla Coco with the little <laughs> kitten that was her friend. The idea is regulation can like crush the kitten or regulation can actually cradle the kitten and take the kitten from a kitten to like a full-blown, you know, I don't know, mountain lion or whatever it is, right? And that's kind of what you want because you want to understand that there are going to be bad actors in any ecosystem. We don't want those actors wind up winding up taking all the air out of the room and speaking for the community, right? So when you think about Bitcoin and criminals, well, that wound up over identifying, there's an identification for a little bit of time with Bitcoin and criminal activity because that's where the activity and that's what was getting the press. Meanwhile, there's all kinds of other really phenomenal stuff happening in parallel that wasn't really getting that attention. So you do want to have the ability to to hold bad actors or those who are trying to exploit accountable. I think that's important. Uh, and regulation can be a tool to do that. But in this particular case, I just feel like we're so early. And like I said, I really worry that some of the newer innovations in DeFi, and again, this is also new, but like the cutting edge innovations right around credit insurance, things like this, um, I do worry are going to be, there's, there's going to be a hesitancy on the part of builders to engage in those spaces because they're worried that their entire model is going to somehow, you know, be regulated out of existence. And that, I think, would be a very terrible outcome for society. Especially when you see FedEx regulations, FedEx proposed guidelines saying, well, somebody who put that software out there, even though they have nothing to do with it anymore, could be held accountable. And in some instances, exactly. we've got a lot of pushback. Um, yeah, and I, I, I would think rightly so. I think what's one thing you mentioned that's really interesting is how our regulatory thinking is so much embedded in a wider social political context. And you you said about well, the fear factor that we are living in right now and um, well, the games, GameStop. How do you think DeFi, and that's the last question and I'll let you go, I promise, but how do you think <laughs> DeFi is the result of a certain social political context and how do you think that context will remain relevant for a long time and shape it? 
it's not just about technology. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I think you go back to 2008. That context has been around for a while. It's hardly a new context that we're dealing with. And really, it well predates 2008. It goes back to the beginning of the banking system. So let's just be real. These inequities and biases have been built in from the very beginning. And we talk a lot on the Money Reimagined podcast about redlining and the Bank Secrecy Act and you know all these kinds of activities that have resulted in the inequities that exist today, which I think is really important. Uh, to note. Now, uh, I don't think that context is going away. And I think there is such heightened, I mean, you see SPACs, there's so much heightened awareness of the lack of access and the lack of equal access to capital uh, in particular, right? So I don't think that's going away. I think if anything, the voices are getting louder and louder and louder. In parallel, let's not forget the cultural moment where, you know, some of the early builders of big, you know, centralized tech platforms are coming forth and saying like, oh gosh, we didn't think about this and that. And, oh, you know, all this kind of consciousness raising around these kinds of things too. So Web3 is also something that's really relevant to DeFi and not everyone necessarily links those things, but they are extremely linked together in terms of cultural movements that are are coming into play. I think the direction of travel and the weight is very much towards more empowerment of users. I think that is critically important. I think we should be looking at regulation to the extent that we, you know, are doing that um, as something that is focused on user empowerment, not necessarily protection of incumbents, but really user empowerment, and that businesses and protocols and everything DAO should be held accountable and responsible for focusing on user empowerment and being much more human-centric and user-centric in design and in execution and applications. Um, and so, you know, as a result, I don't know that our existing laws around consumer protection, for example, are oriented the right way. Like, first of all, they talk about consumers, not users. Really, we think more about users in our ecosystem more than, you know, consumers per se, right? And you could argue those terms are somewhat, you can elide them. But really, I think it's important to shift away from a sheer consumer kind of model into a stakeholder model where the users here actually have stake in these systems and they are actually active participants if they choose to be getting back to the proxy discussion. If they choose to be in the development of those ecosystems, which is a critically important thing to note. And so um, I I just think our regulatory model, it just doesn't port over into this space because we had not contemplated a world in which there was any ability for stakeholders to really meaningfully engage in a system apart from something like a strike suit. Right. And that isn't really what we're talking about here. So. I, I think our legal system has to evolve. I think that's going to happen, I hope, before our regulatory system evolves, because I think the regulation will actually match what we what we actually observe as being legal issues that arise here. I'm, of course, a lawyer, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I really hope that nobody is disincentivized from building in this space, because I think that the opportunities are tremendous, even though there are challenges and even though there are definitely risks. Um, I sincerely hope that anybody interested in this space, you know, really um, picks up the the keys, right, and just gets gets to it because there's so much that can be done that I truly believe will create a more equitable, inclusive, robust, secure financial system that will really be to the benefit of our, our entire society. Thank you so much, Sheila. And on that note, that's a very positive note. So thank you so much for t- talking about looking at DeFi from different angles and touching on so many different issues that are related to DeFi that we may not necessarily bring together. So thank you so much again for making time. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye.